So our first guest speaker is Department of Finance Director Keely Martin Bosler. Ms. Bosler was appointed as a director of California Department of Finance by Governor Edmund G. Brown Jr. in August of 2018 and reappointed by Governor Gavin Newsom in December of 2018. She serves as the governor's chief fiscal policy advisor. Prior to her appointment, she served as a cabinet secretary for Governor Brown's cabinet from 2016 to 2018, I believe. Uh, Director Brosler previously served as a chief deputy budget for the Department of Finance from 2013 to 2016. Uh, Ms. Bosler was a staff director for the California State Senate Budget Fiscal Review Committee from 2010 to 2013. You know, I can go on, but I'm not gonna uh, keep our guests waiting. So I'll let uh, Ms. Bosler please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for that 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 wonderful um, introduction as well. It's my pleasure to be here um, with you all today. Um, just a, a, a week, uh, almost a week after the governor released um, what is definitely a historic uh, May revision. Um, as you could tell from the from my introduction, I have been working around the state budget and both the legislature and um, in the administration for now. Um, almost two decades, and I've never seen anything quite like this. But I mean, I don't think any of us have experienced the year uh, that we just experienced uh, with the global pandemic, uh, COVID-19. And uh, I have been saying, uh, you know, over the last few weeks as we've been working through all of the numbers and all of the extraordinary changes um, that are being made in our budget this year, um, just how big of a swing it has been uh, from a year ago. Um, and just a reminder, a year ago, we were experiencing what is now, um, in retrospect, the largest contraction, the largest decline in gross domestic product on record for the United States and for California. And that was the second quarter of 2020. And so when we were putting the budget together together, a year ago, we really didn't know which direction the pandemic was going to take and how long the closures of our economy were going to last. And that was a very, very uncertain time. And there was a lot of discussion and debate amongst economists um, and others about what was going to happen. But 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 nobody really had uh, the crystal ball, as they say, um, about what was going to happen. Um, uh, come December, when we were putting uh, the governor's January budget, which is normally the, the, the main time the governor presents um, um, his budget is in January. Uh, there things were looking better, but things but we were actually in the, the sorry, things, things were more hopeful about vaccines coming on. Um, but we had one of the highest infection rates. We had stressed hospitals across the state um, during those holiday months. It was a very difficult time in December um, December, and then early January uh, before we released the budget. Uh, we also did not know uh, that the federal government would take such significant action um, and approve almost $3 trillion in stimulus. Um, that all happened after uh, the governor's uh, budget uh, was was finalized. Um, one of the stimulus bills actually got signed right before the governor's budget went to print. But the way our processes work, we have to lock down estimates well in advance of that that time period. So while things were much more um, positive in January uh, in our budget outlook and forecast and resources. Um, uh, they were still somewhat uncertain because we have had a record number of people reliant on the state's unemployment insurance program. And at that time, we did not know that benefits would be extended. And we also didn't have as clear of a focus of how um, accessible the vaccines were going to be. Uh, this spring has been a whirlwind, and uh, and now vaccines are, are readily available, which has been great. 
Uh, and we have had, we have now have one of the lowest infection rates uh, in the country, in the world. Uh, and so things are looking a lot better. And uh, we also, one of the things that we found um, in the pandemic is that the pandemic had a really disproportionate impact on certain populations in our state. And a lot of people in higher wage fields and careers were able to you know, more or less seamlessly transition to working from home uh, and did not have interruptions, large interruptions in their in their revenue and in their in their household budgets. Um, but many households that are working in lower wage sectors like leisure and hospitality uh, and other um, employment, uh, they lost their jobs, they lost many hours um, of work and um, and obviously there's been a significant devastation uh, in, in a lot of small businesses, especially around um, hospitality and the restaurant industry. Um, so there has been a lot of um, hardship over this last year. Uh, the role of government has really changed um, uh, over this last year with the federal government stepping in to provide stimulus payments and significant um, uh, extensions of, of uh, unemployment insurance, um, as well as many uh, funds through many other for many other um, programs that some of which are coming through uh, state government. So this is a lot of lead in to just kind of explain where we are today with what um, I would call, um, again, the, a historic May revision, uh, one that has um, nearly 70, uh, $76 billion in resources to allocate, um, some of that to, to constitutional um, required spending, but $38 billion really in a, in a kind of um, surplus um, definition. Uh, the governor um, is proposing uh, to put together a plan uh, that, or has put together a plan that not only provides immediate relief to help continue to speed the state's recovery from the pandemic. But he also is using some of these one-time monies uh, to address some of California's long-standing challenges and to provide opportunity for um, every California family. And that's really important in light of who has been impacted um, most uh, uh, significantly by the pandemic. And uh, that is a lot of our low income, um, households, uh, families um, across the state. And so there are a lot of proposals that are focused um, around uh, additional supports and opportunities uh, for those, those families. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what we've been doing um, and, and I've been had the opportunity because um, this administration uh, did not let the pandemic uh, stop all of its thinking about how to become um, an employer of choice. And I've been participating throughout the year uh, in, in work groups, uh, talking a lot about how uh, to continue to improve um, state uh, uh, work, uh, work, our work environment for our state employees. Um, this has been a, a year of tremendous change. I, I think about it in just in terms of my department here, the D Department of Finance. Um, you know, I think we, as a, as a state, have been quite a bit more um, historically rigid in terms of the flexibility of working from home and other opportunities for flexible work weeks. And with the pandemic, we were forced to change overnight. Uh, to a different posture. And that, that really um, allowed us to um, explore different tools and different ways of working. Um, uh, it, 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 well, I mean, it allowed or forced, we were forced to do it, but then we learned that we could do things differently. And I think that's been a tremendous, it's been challenging, it's been hard but it has also been um, a tremendous opportunity for learning about what works and what doesn't work. Um, I think we're still gonna be in um, a process for the next, uh, next several years um, as there's more uh, maturity to this pandemic and there's more maturity to our work from home um, and flexible work um, environments. Uh, but, but 
all through this year, the government operations agency, and I've been very fortunate to be a part of it, um, uh, along with Cal HR, you know, have been working on um, kind of three different themes of really improving the data and information that we have about our workforce, uh, data transparency. It's, it's one of those things, if you cannot measure it, you don't really know where you are and what kind of progress you're making. So that has been a really key investment that the state has been making. Um, the other thing is, is really working to eliminate bias in hiring and promotion. Uh, and doing a lot of training and, and different uh, uh, processes and procedures. Uh, and then finally, measuring success. And so again, data and measuring are, are, are really to go hand in hand uh, so that we can actually see what kind of results we're doing and what strategies are working and what strategies um, are not working. Uh, and, and this is especially, uh, you know, this has been one, one of the many areas of focus, but one of the important areas of focus has certainly been persons with disabilities. Uh, and I, you know, and I, as I think about how um, much has changed in the year in terms of how our work environments look, I think about all of the things that we're going to continue have to refine and get better at and work through. Um, as we as we move forward uh, uh, um, out of this pandemic, um, I would be happy to talk just of, about a few of the priorities in the governor's budget. Uh, again, immediate relief um, is is one area because um, we recognize that many people over the last year have built up a lot of debts. Uh, and have had a lot of impacts directly from the pandemic and the economic uh, decline th uh, that occurred. And so we are proposing um, a historic state um, stimulus that would go to all households up to 75,000, um, and that would be for $600, with an additional $500 um, for those um, households that have dependents. And so that's really a centerpiece of our recovery um, portion of our budget. Uh, uh, we also have additional relief um, for uh, uh, utility bills. In, in many cases, uh, uh, people had very tough choices to make in their household budgets. And in some cases, utility bills did not get paid. So we have $2 billion to address both water and electricity utility bills. Uh, and then we have another one and a half billion to add to the two and a half billion that we provided for small businesses. So these are for grants up to $25,000 uh, to really um, help keep our small businesses afloat that, that employ so many Californians. Um, one area I really wanna focus on is the is school spending and K through 12 schools, just like the rest of us have gone through tremendous strains and stresses as they also have had to re, um, rethink their entire model um, in order to protect public health um, in the short term. And uh, they are continuing uh, to uh, adjust and um, uh, uh, most schools have brought students back, but this has had a tremendous impact uh, on uh, students and uh, teachers alike. Uh, and there is a lot that we need to work, work through uh, to get our schools uh, back on track. Uh, the governor's budget does propose a, a historic level of funding, state funding for schools. Um, the federal government was also able to provide um, over 15 billion uh, for our schools as well. And the governor's focus is really gonna be on early, early, um, early education, uh, he's proposing a, a, the historic um, expansion of a universal preschool program. Um, this is incredibly important uh, for our future uh, and something that we've talked about for many, many, many years. Um, but, uh, you know, this has been an opportunity to make that a reality. Um, there's also significant other investments. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up is obviously um, all of the research um, about uh, uh, children and identifying disabilities early um, and being able to provide supports and programs 
Um, that all has been impacted by the pandemic as well. And so we have a really exciting proposal um, in our what we call the Early Start Program um, that allows uh, families uh, to have a longer time uh, to access services um, and, and work with professionals uh, to identify um, any issues that, um, uh, that, that need to be addressed. And so that's a really exciting thing uh, that we've done uh, in this budget uh, to really address the impacts of, pandem of the pandemic on families, especially families of young children um, uh, that uh, may have a, a, um, a disability that they, that they want to um, get treatment and support uh, to address. Um, I'm going to maybe end there because there are so much I could talk about in this budget, but I really want to hear your questions. And, um, and I'm just very thankful for this group and um, your leadership uh, throughout the state uh, in uh, the, the area of, um, of disability and employment. And we have some, some actually some really exciting um, expansions on workforce pro programs, especially um, including programs uh, 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 for people who are in the, our developmentally disabled system. Um, we also have a special focus on individuals with autism um, as well uh, uh, to improve the um, number of uh, job opportunities uh, for individuals uh, 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 with, with that uh, disability. But I will end, end there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Bosler. Uh, I'm very grateful that you took the time out of your busy day to present here. And so far, we really like uh, what we have heard. So thank you. And we'll open this up for questions uh, to present. So previously, the governor said he wanted something like 70% or 75% of state workforce to telework. And are there any provision in the May revision to support governor's uh, telework policy. I understand there is some reference to infrastructure, but is there anything there to support telework for the workers? You know, for example, some departments are subsidizing the, the internet fee and so on. So anything like that or ergonomic Support yeah, no, it's a, good, it's a good question. And it's one that I know our Department of um, Human Resources, CalHR, has been working through and doing a lot of thinking about because this, this has been a tremendous change and our workers have, uh, have uh, you know, have really risen to the occasion and have been flexible and have figured out how to make it work. And, and that has been wonderful. And so we know that um, going forward, that there is an interest in having more uniformity um, across state departments uh, and um, policies uh, so that there is guidance uh, for state departments. So I know that CalHR is working with all of our um, uh, major labor uh, partners uh, to work on uh, those those arrangements and and certainly telework is is a part of the of the conversation because it's such a big part of of the conversation about employment and how it's going to go forward. So we we definitely have been thoughtful about um, about making sure that we're planning. Um, but I don't have anything unfortunately specific to announce today because that is all being worked out um, through the collective bargaining process. Uh, but but certainly it is something that we have been um, having lots of conversations about because we are in recognition of of, of the impacts uh, that uh, the changes over the last year have had on individuals and uh, and uh, and uh, their um, and and we want that we want people to be supported um, in work. Uh, so I think oh yeah. So very I don't have, helpful. unfortunately, I don't have anything specific, but I do know that we, we are very, I'm very in, in tune with the issue and something that we're working on, but we, we, there will be more to come in the coming weeks. Yeah, well, I'm glad that uh, you are cognizant of the problem yes, and you're working on it. So hopefully, yeah. Yeah. hopefully we'll hear something. My I other question. My, my, my own situation when I work at home is not as uh, ergonomic for, for certain. <laughs> Well, for many of us, ergonomic is, you know, an important, essential part right. that allows us to actually function. 
Yeah. Uh, so my follow up question that that is the governor established several task forces to increase equity in state services. One of them was the diversity task force, which included a disability employment subgroup. Mm -hmm. I know that the the final recommendation of the diversity task force and the disability task force has been presented to the administration. So my questions are, was any funding included in the May revision to support the recommendation regarding increasing employment of qualified person with disabilities in state service? And second, if not, what is the status of the final recommendation has, in other words, has your office finance weighed in on them? And when will, do you think it's gonna be made available? Um, these are very good questions, and I actually recall that there was a meeting right um, last week that unfortunately I wasn't able to attend, but I have been a part of those conversations, as have many of my staff um, who are very, uh, very dedicated and invested to um, a, you know, a strong and diverse workforce, um, and especially uh, uh, making sure that the, we have inclusion uh, for all all persons, um, including persons with disabilities. And so I, I know that we have additional funding for the an, an equity officer at GevOps that will really continue and lead that work um, going forward. And then really a lot of the recommendations have to do with, with really integrating this work into the everyday operations of state government. And so that continues uh, to be the, the crux, again, the data systems um, that are consistent across all departments so that we can track centrally and um, address issues, um, additional training um, as well. And those are all things that we've been um, uh, supporting. Uh, but I, I, can't, I can't point to one specific thing because it's really about how we are asking all of our state departments to do their work differently. Um, but uh, uh, I, will, I, I, I think this is all a, a work in progress and I'm happy to get back to you with more specifics. Great, terrific. Thank you so much. So could we follow up with you at some yeah, point? Absolutely. Great. Yeah, great, thank you very much. And I know the gentleman is patiently waiting and we have quite a few questions in our chat. Yeah. So I will let uh, Mr. Clark go ahead and answer your question on mute or ask your question rather. There we go. There we go. Had it on mute. Uh, Director Bustler, um, my name is Dan Clark. <clears throat> I'm uh, with uh, AXID, which is the Association of California State Employees with Disabilities. Right. Uh, we're recognized. I don't know if you recognize us, but we're we're recognized by CalHR as a bona fide organization to represent uh, disabled uh, employees in state service. And we've been around for a number of years. So anyway, um, in, in 2015, a little background, 2015, we participated in what's called the Joint Projects on Employment with Persons with Disabilities. With, it was with the Department of Rehab, State Personnel Board, and CalHR. And from that uh, project, we were able to outline a number of issues and uh, that are barriers of people with disabilities and identify some recommendations. And since that time, we've been kind of working on those recommendations, and some of them have been sort of addressed, but not really the some of the real um, meat and potatoes, I, I should say. So, um, in um, just uh, in 2019, um, AB 365 was passed unanimously by both houses, but only vetoed by the governor when he got to his desk. Now he said he. He indicated he supported the goals, and I think I think that's what led into uh, Bobby Duda's uh, question about the task force. Because subsequently, he did, he put together this task force, and then a subcommittee on disability was there, and we we were able through that process to submit some of the same some of the major issues that we had concerns with. Um, but concurrently, on the side, we were we worked on AB three sixty five, as I stated earlier. To, um, to to work on some of these recommendations. They were included, pretty much included in 365, got passed, and then the governor said he vetoed it, but he said he could do it 
administratively. And maybe that's the result of the conversations you're having, which is nice to hear. Um, but again, we weren't sure where it was, where things are going. So currently we're, we're co we're co-sponsoring with the, uh, disability rights, California, AB 313, which has some of the same similar provisions. So, and right now it's in suspense. So I guess my question to you is, can you tell us if finance has any specific concerns about 313, AB 313, if you know anything? Because ACCET and DRC are very open right now to, to negotiate, have discussions, to see where the issues are, to try to get this thing passed. We'd like, we wouldn't like to see it vetoed because, again, it has some provisions that keep on, if they're dressed, will alleviate issues we're seeing out there with people with disabilities and state service. Um, so, oh. Ms. Buzzley, you're muted. And I, I can't tell you today because I, I haven't had a chance myself. I know that my, one of my staff has is re, um, reviewing that piece of legislation, but I haven't had a chance to review that myself. So I'm going to have to get back to you, but I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and and I should be able to give you um, a more comprehensive view on on because I know many of the recommendations um, that have been discussed over many years have mm -hmm. been things that have been uh, discussed uh, during the task force. And so I just mm -hmm. want to make sure I'm accurate and um, giving you the the correct mm -hmm. information. So I'll need to get back to you on that. But thank you, Dan. Okay. I've written your name down. And, and Bobby, I assume I can get a hold of Dan through you. Absolutely. Okay. I'd be happy to pass it along. All right. Um, Thank yeah. you so much, Dan, for your, that comprehensive if, question. I want a little sort of follow-up. Um, if, if you have anybody there you'd like us to talk to to help process, you know, when you get back with us, let us know. And we'll yeah, be glad I, will, to, I will. I will absolutely connect you with yeah. um, my team that um, uh, has that piece of legislation and um, and and we can talk through um, Good. Some issues there. So thank great. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have J. L. Gutierrez asking, "When does the early school program funding take effect? Yeah. And can so, you please repeat the income amount for the historical release? Yes. Historic release. So, so, so um, for the um, early school, so that's transitional kindergarten. So it's really a 14th year of public school. We'll be phasing that in um, starting next year in 22-23. And there'll be three months of children a year added. And this is all if, if approved by the legislature. So we've only just made a proposal to the legislature at this, at this point. Um, but that's really exciting. Right now, um, transitional kindergarten is just offered for four-year-olds um, uh, or children who turn five uh, between September and December. Um, but now it will be for all children, um, uh, 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 regardless of the month. Uh, so all four-year-olds, regardless of the month uh, that they're born. Uh, so that's uh, really uh, exciting and um, important uh, on a number of different uh, fronts. Uh, in terms of the, his the relief, um, it is a $600 stimulus um, or tax rebate. Uh, and it is going to households um, uh, that have adjusted gross income uh, less than seventy-five thousand. Um, we estimate that between the first stimulus that was already approved earlier this year that went to households making thirty thousand and less, um, oh. that it, we will actually reach two-thirds of the state's population, um, which is pretty phenomenal. Okay, and then I have another question. I'm going to ask the questions from Dev and then throw it over to Alan. He's going to ask you verbally. Um, Dev asks, can you tell us more about the workforce programs with the focus on including people with disabilities? Would this include revamp of reasonable accommodations? We have issues where folks are getting the accommodation while on LEAP, but once they're out of the LEAP program, the accommodation is taken away. And they are held to their job duties in the duty statement, i.e. lifting 20 pounds or more without a cart. This is the case in the custodial services? That's one question from Deb. The other one is, how can we contact the disability equity offers at GovOp? So those are the two questions for Deb for you. 
Um, so I know that the, the, the one proposal um, that is specifically, um, it's a joint proposal between the Department of Developmental Services and the Department of Rehabilitation um, is uh, really about um, establishing a training and certification program. And I actually heard the directors present to the legislature this weekend, and I was I was actually even more excited about the proposal than when we approved it over here at the Department of Finance. So it's it's really about really really expanding opportunities for employment um, across the board. Uh, for individuals with disabilities um, uh, and, uh, you know, really uh, thinking differently about how to recruit and retain employers uh, to be a part um, um, uh, to, to, uh, to understand and to be able to um, um, take these opportunities. Um, so I, so it's, it's a comprehensive um, proposal and um, that is something, there is also another specific proposal at the Workforce Development Board um, that is specific around individuals um, with autism. Uh, and that is also another um, uh, focus uh, in the budget. There are, are many, many workforce programs um, in this budget, obviously the state has just recovered only 44% of the jobs that were lost in, in um, March and April of last year. Uh, so there is a lot of, there's going to be a lot of um, uh, need uh, for training because uh, sometimes in some cases, jobs are not coming back the way they were um, eliminated. And so thinking about how we, uh, we make sure that people have opportunities for training and, and um, uh, um, other uh, types of programs, and I'm sorry, I don't have I don't have an answer on the reasonable accommodation. I'm just not that familiar with exactly what you are um, um, talking about here. But I'm happy to get back uh, to you on that as well. So we can always you can always send us information to Bobby, and we can forward it to the whole team. We do that to, to answer questions to give time. Um, okay, so then also we have Alan Goldstein. Alan, do you want to unmute and ask your questions? Yes. Hi, Director Bosler. Uh, I'm an attorney with SEIU Local 1000, so that's, yeah. that's my Hi. perspective. I just want to say first, I really appreciated your comments. I'm going to be really embarrassed when they read my bio after hearing yours. Oh, God. Um, oh, God, no. <laughs> but, um, and I appreciate you you know, acknowledging the state has been, and I wrote this down, historically rigid in terms of flexible workplace issues. I think the last year has been a learning experience for all of us. You know, for 20 years, I've been preaching telework, and I feel like I owe the world and I told you so somewhere. But I'm just so glad you're appreciating what we've all learned the past year. Um, it's, been, it's been incredible to watch my department. Um, I mean, we have, we have these very, very, you know, steep peak work seasons where, you know, people are, are working really around the clock and, and, you know, I, we were a lot of us that, that grew up working in state service and we've grown up working a certain way, you know, at our desk in the office. Um, you know, I think I was, I got worried several times throughout the year, but, um, but we were able to um, produce uh, our products and get our work done and, uh, you know, I see the ingenuity and the flexibility, especially, um, you know, of, of a lot of our, our workers that, you know, are, are more flexible than me, maybe. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think it's been a tremendous uh, to see how people um, could rise to the occasion and, um, and still be able to turn out the work products and the, the, um, the service uh, to the state, uh, which is what our job is. Thank you. I appreciate it. I actually had two different questions. One, I was wondering if there's any planned expansion of the LEAP program. I've done some PRA requests, and in my opinion, the LEAP program is way too narrow. I don't quite understand why every state position can't have LEAP candidates. Um, I've supervised lawyers with what's called Asperger's or with blind deaf, who are blind deaf, deaf blind. I just feel like every state position should should be able to have lead candidates. I think that's a great entryway for people with disabilities into the workforce. Um, I saw the comment about the accommodations. They should definitely continue after the program ends. But I, I would love to see an expansion of that program. I was wondering if there's anything 
planned? And then I have a second question regarding school issues. Um, I, I do not know the answer to your question, Alan, on lead. Um, uh, I remind me, this is, this is a um, program. Um, I'm just, I am blanking. Yeah, Le LEAP, L-E-A-P, limited examination. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will need to get back to you because I do not have that specific information. But um, okay. but it sounds like I know that that um, uh, there's still a lot of focus on um, upward mobility uh, uh, programs. Um, you know, we I know we're doing that here at the Department of Finance, um, giving people opportunities to um, train into different positions and classifications. Um, uh, uh, but I, but I, I do not have the specific information on, on LEAP. It's L-E-A-P? L-E-A-P, yes. I okay. do, yeah, and, and, and part of my goal is to put these things on, on maybe your radar screen. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm curious. You have piqued my interest. I'm and I, I gave some thought. comments to the state personnel board about a year ago. I'd be happy to share okay. those with you. Um, and my second question, I, I, I so appreciate you talking about early education and detection of just students with disabilities. It, it's so key. Um, in Illinois, I handled a lawsuit to have the state high schools have uh, integrated sporting opportunities for high school students with disabilities at all meets across the state, state wow. championships. Wow. When I came to California, I worked at Disability Rights California and spoke with the California Interscholastic Federation about the same issue because uh, California does not have statewide integrated sporting high school opportunities. Right. And I learned it's really school district by school district. Uh, and I would just love to see a more comprehensive program. For me, high school wasn't about, you know, math or history. It was about being on the track team and playing basketball. So I feel like students with disabilities should have those same yeah. opportunities for sports and integrated opportunities. And I, I'd love to see the state about half of the country actually has various programs like that, but California isn't one of them. Oh, interesting. So, and I yeah. have a lot of data on that. Um, so I'm happy to share that too, but I, I think that that would be something great. Thank you, Alan. And, and I, and I, in the brevity of time, I wasn't able to highlight all of the aspects of, of the governor's budget re with relate with relation to schools. And one of the big investment areas um, is exactly those enrichment. Like you just said, you know, school wasn't, for you about the the math and English classes, but it was about all of the other activities that you were able to participate in. And so we do have significant money that's 1 billion growing to 5 billion over the next several years um, that we want to go uh, to low income schools, um, uh, schools that, that serve low income um, families uh, around the state uh, primarily uh, and really provide all of those um, after school programs, extended day, extended year into the summer, um, arts, sports, music. And um, I definitely, uh, you know, I, I think your, your point about uh, making certain that there's opportunities for all students um, are really uh, um, uh, important as well. So I will take that back. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, um, I have, well, first of all, before I get into my next question, I did want to let everyone know that um, Glena Wheeler, um, from the chief is the chief officer of civil rights at Cal HR. She's in the comments and she's saying that um, I'm responsible for statewide guidance on reasonable accommodation and also responsible for the statewide LEAP program. So if anybody has additional questions, okay, um, uh, okay. we have someone in the comments <laughs> that can, that, that actually can answer those questions about those two programs specifically and okay. has, has pointed that out. Um, so then I have one more question. Um, so will state employees be expected to return to the office after June 15th or will the telework continue until the union and Cal HR work out the details? That was Mindy's question. Healy, do you, do you have any information about that? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable because it's really more of a Cal HR. I mean, we support them in their, um, uh, work with uh, in collective bargaining, but I I don't have um, uh, you know we're we're making plans. I know as a department director, I know we're making plans for what the future of our telework program is. But um, you know, I think that I defer to Cal HR in terms of statewide guidance. I completely understand that. Okay, Keely. Um, uh, I'm going to ask my question that I've been holding on to. Okay, um, okay. If anybody else has, if 
anybody else has some questions, um, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the comments and I will follow up next. Um, but, uh, you know, as someone who's a, a part of my DAC at my local agency and a person with a disability, um, I know that uh, in our community, there's a lot of concern about the fact that persons with disabilities um, who are working are, are like, we're, we don't get a lot of attention. You know, if you're a person with disability, you're not working, you get attention. Um, the concern I've been having is that I'm hearing that um, with COVID, there's a lot of people who are ending up with a post viral condition that like it's, it's, it's that oh, it's I not know. just, yeah. it's yeah. not just a, um, a, a, not just an event where people are dying or where people are getting sick. It's also a mass disabling event effectively. Um, and I know I, I don't, I don't hear that so far we've talked specifically about COVID in the budget, but has just as a question to you, have you heard anything discussed about like the fact that there, there may be more persons with a disability yeah, no, out I, there after this event? It is, it is something that we have had conversations about. Um, and, uh, you know, it's amazing to me when I when I was sitting at the state operations center a year ago, how little we knew about the virus and how it was going to impact people and how even it was transmitted and how much we have learned in, in this year. Oh, yeah. And I think we are continuing to learn more. Uh, and I know we have many uh, very um, expert public health um, individuals and doctors um, across the health and human services agency. And we will we will continue to learn more and and how that how that impacts um, our uh, uh, um, um, our our programs that support long term disability uh, workers comp um, uh, compensation issues. Um, but I I know that that is one thing that I have certainly read some about and have have heard discussed um, in my in the course of my work here. Um, but I don't. I don't want us to pretend like we know all of the answers right now. We don't. Um, but understandable. It's, it's certainly something uh, that uh, we um, will be. Uh, what will be one of the many things that we will be continuing to work on um, as as we get the the pandemic more in the rearview mirror. <laughs> um, but the impacts are certainly um, going to be lasting uh, in in many areas and 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 for many people. Uh, and so uh, I do want to recognize that your question is a very good one and it, and it should be something that we we are um, uh, it is something we are we are thinking about and working towards, but we don't have all the answers today. It heartens me to hear that at least the topic has come up that this yes. may end up with more people who need help. Um, and as someone who cares about the 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 persons with the disability that are trying to work, um, that you know, I'm always hopeful that we'll get a little bit more attention out of uh, you yeah. know, like uh, to one, to help the, us try to make this other, happen. Yeah, that's yeah. One of the other really big things, and this is a little bit of a segue, but it's it, it's it shows I think the recognition that the governor um, has and and our health and human services agency secretary as well has been a huge champion. Um, we have a we have a very large and comprehensive um, behavioral health uh, proposal, mental health proposal for students. Um, and young people. So zero to 25 is the focus uh, because we really, I think, are, 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 are really trying to make sure that we don't have, you know, generational impacts of this past year. Um, Absolutely. On, on um, especially our young people. Um, but, but um, we, we've all, we've all gone through the fire, if you will, <laughs> um, this last year with our own personal struggles and challenges. Um, and uh, and so I think important uh, uh, that we keep working on these issues and, and issue spot uh, because the amount of shock and change that has happened over the last year is is really uh, you know once in a lifetime we hope so. Thank uh, you so much for your answer. And do, do we have anybody else that um, that would like to ask a question? I don't have any more questions in the comments. Um, you can raise your hand or feel free to unmute really quickly. Give it a second. This is Bobby. I, I just have one quick comment. You know, you, you brought up the mental health proposal. I'm really happy to hear that. Uh, May is the Mental Health Awareness Month. So I want everyone to be aware of that. So we are celebrating that in light of, you know, how far we have come. So it's heartening for me to hear that there is some serious proposal on the table. Uh, my question to you is the comment you made earlier during your presentation 
data transparency and eliminating bias in hiring. What exactly is the proposal to address data transparency and particular interest to us in our community is eliminating higher, you know, bias in hiring. In other words, are, is there any specific plan to address two issues that you brought up? Yes, there is. There is. There is a whole matrix um, of, of problem statements and then recommendations and um, proposed timeline. And this is something that um, uh, many working groups have been working on over the last year. Uh, and there are different strategies um, in different um, uh employee groups, because uh, uh, obviously there are, there are different challenges in different employee groups, but um, we do have a multi-pronged uh, plan. And I, I am just one of the people that have been ha had an opportunity to input into it, but I'm not the leader. And so I actually may, may want to defer to Jenna um, or others from CalHR that, that could go into the specifics about where um, we are. Um, I know that the chief equity officer uh, that we are proposing to create at the government operations agency um, is going to be a primary um, in making sure that this agenda of work continues to move forward. Um, a lot of it, it uh, you know, is we have we have the tools in place, and it's now about really collecting and then holding accountable and 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 moving. Um, policies and procedures across the state forward uh, in order to uh, um, uh, get the the continual improvement that we all want to see in this area. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, looks I'm sorry, like I can't a lot be of... more specific on that. No, that's, that's that's totally uh, fine. We have uh, we have Glenna Wheeler to refer these questions to. So <laughs> I'm sure I'll I'll invite uh, Miss Wheeler to present uh, at SDEC. Hopefully she'll join us next. Uh, I don't have any questions. I see that there is a hand raised somewhere. Do you have a new uh, question, Dan Clark? Yeah. yeah. No, I just there. wanted. Yeah. This is Dan Clark again from Access. I just wanted to uh, add to a couple of comments. Some of the recommendations I was referring to that we sent to the task force, as well as incorporating those bills. Are, are what we're addressing some of the leap issues that the questions okay. that came up as well as the RA the RA policy is is something that we've um, been looking at for a while and I think there's something in play and I'd like to see that implemented so yes, I just got my note on that. yes yeah and and, and and going back to the leap uh, a model that that that's similar to what um, Alan was talking about is in the federal government they have a they have a program called schedule A it's somewhat similar where a person with a disability, if qualified, the disability can apply for a position very similar to how LEAP works, but it's every position. It doesn't, it's not selected to uh, mm -hmm. five or six different classifications. In, in the federal government, if it's the it's any position. So there are um, there, there's other models to look at if you want to look at. So oh great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So Bobby, it looks like we're wrapping up um, on, with, the, with the questions. I'm going to throw it back to you. Keely, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. No, I appreciate having the opportunity to um, be with you all this morning and um, look forward to continuing to do great work for the state. And I think your guidance and uh, through this, this, this major time of change um, is going to be um, even more um, important. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, your presentation has been extremely helpful and informative. Our SDAC members truly appreciate the uh, knowledge that you imparted to us. So thank you very much. We'll follow up with your office with the All questions. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks again. And uh, come back okay. and see us soon. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you for your time. Bye -bye. Thank you.